Hi, I'm Jonathan Dodd. I'm from Ipsos, New Zealand, and I'm very pleased to have me today um, Jill Whitehead. Jill Whitehead's come out from the UK to speak at a marketing association Brady Breakfast this morning. We managed to capture her for a, a few minutes afterwards. It was very well attended with a lot of good questions, and we've got a few more for her now. She's the she's Director of Audience Technologies and Insight at Channel 4 UK, and Jill's just been sharing with us a lot of pretty incredible stories and activities they're doing in the UK. So I'm going to ask her again to repeat for the audience at home some of the key learnings she's got out of that, and I have a few other questions for her as well. So thanks for coming along, Jill. Pleasure. Nice um, I guess we'll just start with a big picture, and um, in New Zealand we were so used to looking overseas and trying to look through um, magazines online and try and get a feel for what's happening overseas. From your perspective, what do you see as the biggest issues facing the New Zealand market is today? Um, I think I see I see opportunity, I guess. So I guess um, the impact of the internet um, can be quite disruptive on businesses, but it also creates opportunity as well. And so what we've been focusing on is how to use uh, the internet as an opportunity to engage your customers. Um, and then use the resulting data from that engagement that you get and first party data to essentially know more about your audience than anyone else knows. Um, and, and then you can use that for your products, you can use that for your marketing, you can use that into, for operational efficiencies and you can use that in the way that you price and sell your, uh, your products. So I, I, I think that's the opportunity. Um, that the internet is bringing. That relates, I think, to the first key lesson that you gave today, which is about getting the value exchange right. Yeah, yeah. so I'm obsessive about this. <laughs> so I think uh, the value exchange is around getting the balance of what's in it for your customer with what's in it for you. So when you're asking them to engage with you, you're really understanding what it is they might want to engage with you in. And then you're designing a, if you're asking them to engage with you, to register or sign up or connect, you're giving them some benefits in return for that that are absolutely smack in the heart of what they want to engage with. And we've, we've in that journey, we've come up with a sort of engagement funnel, if you like. So at scale, our biggest numbers are people whose engagement with us, with a broadcaster, a free-to-air broadcaster, is with our programs. So they're engaging with our programs and the content. So tools that allow them to see things first, or watch watch things before they're on TV, or allow them to find and discover things in better ways, watch them on the move. They're great for the vast majority. But sort of towards the bottom of the funnel, um, are people who actually really want to engage more with us as a brand um, and they're opting in to hear from us so they're, they're, you know, we're doing a lot of targeted emails and CRM program around there and then we've got a, a group who, with whom they want rewards so they want to engage with us in, in coming to film screenings and being in the audience and then some who are feeding back to us on our shows so I think um, so they're actually really wanting to feel as if they're influencing Channel 4 um, and so I think Getting the value exchange right is about understanding how, what ways your audience wants to engage to you and recognising that the fact that engagement is going to be different for all of your yeah. audience and so designing something for all parts of the funnel. You mentioned that a big challenge was um, while you've got a lot of rich data, it's a lot harder to actually use that, um, that data to aid the creative process, to re which is obviously trying to work out from from scratch, particularly for programming and commissioning, what will really engage with people, and, and I think that relates to um, this issue about the value exchange. Because while you've got um, a, a product, you know, what, what Channel Four obviously is compelling content yep, and, and, yep. A, and a digital platform for marketers in other categories that might not have much yep. of a digital platform, yep. they might be using social media at most. Yep, yep. How do they understand the value exchange better, particularly to enable if they're challenged by giving something back to the, their customers beyond, you know, maybe an FMCG product or yeah. something like that. Yeah. So we used a. This is about understanding the sort of the 
really what it is that people are buying and what it is that they're buying into when they're buying your brand. So we used a hell of a lot of consumer research, standard focus groups to take us through this. So I think whether your business is digital or not, um, there's still the opportunity to do this. And, um, uh, you know, I think... I think brands have approached it in different ways. If I look at, I'm a young mum, um, so I, uh, uh, my, I've got one, I've got two boys um, under the age of three, and, and so nappies have been a huge thing in our life for the last few years. And and so if I look at Pampers, um, they've come up with a Pampers subscription product, so they they understand that repeat purchase is really important and they also understand that the kids are getting older and they're needing bigger nappies and they've come up with a really br and that they're huge and they fill up your car so they've come up with a brilliant subscription product where they just arrive at my doorstep and they're anticipating they use the data to anticipate the frequency of which I need my next order and also my child's age in terms of when I might need to move up to a next size so I think that's a really good example of how um, an FMC kind of product in nappies can really understand customer engagement and use its channels and its retail channels um, to have a better understanding of its customer and then use it to drive um, to drive sell through. I guess um, that brings me on to the second key me message that you talked about today which is about maintaining trust yeah. and integrity yeah. and the nappies example I think is an interesting one because um, I imagine as part of that service you had to say, you know, you had yep. two boys and yep. their ages, yep. which is yep. often it's the provision, providing of our children's information yep. where the privacy right. sort of alert goes up. Yes. So in situations like that, did they have to go to an extra strength or perhaps it was just the trust of the brand campus that enabled you to feel comfortable? How do, how do companies um, have to, well, I'll ask for your recommendations really on building the trust and integrity. Yeah, I, I think it's about being totally upfront and transparent. Um, so we uh, focus on only asking for data, because we ask for personal data, we ask for name, email address, date of birth, postcode, full, full postal address, we ask for voluntarily and gender. So that's personal information. Um, we explain on each field why it is that we want right, it, so it's not just and video. what we use it for. Um, and then we have a video to because we have a particularly young audience, so we want to explain it to them in a way that they can understand and act upon. We explain what we're going to do with it, and we explain what we don't do with it, and how they manage to how and how they can delete it and opt out of things. So I think I just have this guiding rule, which is if you can't explain it to your customers in a way that they can understand and act upon, then don't do it. So uh, um, so for a postal address, we explain we. We asked you to give us your full postal address optionally, and then we explain this is for relevant advertising. Advertising helps us fund more programs. Yeah. And just in that single sentence, 80% of people every day who register volunteer their full postal address. So we now have 8 million registered users who've given us our postal address. Just about transparency. Is the um, Alan Carr video available for anybody to find? Globally, to globally. So yeah. I, rec I recommend yeah. our viewers to Google up the Alan Carr um, Channel 4 video to... If you, if you Google <laughs> Channel 4 Viewer Promise, Alan Carr, then use the video. Right. Up. Okay, it, that's it's great practice. I'm um, not sure when you flew over here if you saw the Air New Zealand in flight safety video. <laughs> no, I didn't. I flew on Emirates. So. Oh, well, hopefully you're going back in New Zealand <laughs> and you'll see that they take the same approach brilliant, to taking brilliant. a dull message and, yeah, and yeah, making yeah. it more engaging. Yeah. All right. Um, lastly, you, you talked about the fact of trial and, and iteration. Um, really digging into your data and yep. building things up. I'll ask you to um, obviously go over that again for those people who went at the breakfast, but to bear in mind that when you talked about the huge cost of data scientists and the challenges you have in getting data scientists to do this trial and iteration and so forth, you know, the, the cost challenges that you face are exacerbated enormously in New Zealand where we have, you know, our population's only 6% of yours. So when you talk about trial and iteration, customised marketing um, to a New Zealand audience, we really obviously want to know yeah. what you've got to say, but bearing in mind that we have very few people. Yeah, no, no. Well, the good news is the cost of doing this whole, in this whole area have come down hugely since we started. So data is now stored in the cloud, which is you know far lower cost of data storage than ever. And the processing technologies that you use are are coming out of Silicon Valley and they're open source, which largely means they're free. Yep. 
Um, so so that the cost base has radically changed and it's now it's a lot lower and it's also variable cost so you're not paying huge fixed costs for it. Data scientists are expensive, but you only need a couple of them. Um, and also we've taken our approach where we sort of have a senior data scientist who is really experienced, who has a high salary, um, and uh, but then the for the team who sits who sits with him, um, they we have sponsored masters and PhD programs um, with the leading universities, and so a that's in, that's really supporting some of our graduates in great data science get into business and get business experience. From our perspective, it means we get them in their final year of their degree, and we get them for a couple of years, and then they go and work in banking and earn loads of money, and that's fine with us because then we've got the next pool of graduates coming through. So we've wound up finding, and we didn't get there straight away. Um, but we've wound up finding that is the model that we can afford um, to do. And then in trial and, you know, we do, we start with sort of the two lessons. We start with an end business benefit, like we want to sell targeted advertising, and then we mine the data for that purpose. So you don't, you avoid analysis paralysis by sort of being really, uh, decisive about what it is you want to achieve and then with everything we test it in small scale really really manual testing yep. you know it do, this doesn't cost a lot so we sort of you know we wanted to test a sort of targeted marketing piece and we literally sort of had Barry carrying the asset and putting it in here and stuff and that's fine because it still gets you the same results and then and even now some of that's a bit manual and we're because the budget to automate it isn't is going to be next year's prioritization, not this sure. year's. So, I think so we, we understand those. Yeah. So we challenges. get, you know, we work, we we prove the concept yeah. in a manual kind of trial, mm -hmm. and then we get the business case to then roll it out. And that's when you've got the data to, to use yeah. with. Now, as a market researcher, um, one of the most ongoing, um, consistent, cha consistent challenges we find when doing research with clients is their lack of data. When we yeah. often ask, do you have consumer data? Do yeah. you have any transactional yeah. data we can start with? Yeah. And um, it's almost a theme that people uh, don't have data or it's inconsistent, uh, particularly inconsistent, um, difficult to access, um, and often, um, or the flip side these days being that they've got too much data and they don't know what to yeah. do with it. Yeah. But generally it seems to be a lack of customer data. Yeah. It still seems to be a big issue facing custom, um, clients in New Zealand. Yeah. I don't know if you have any um, suggestions for how they can address that. Um, well, I think it's it's back to the value exchange, which is working out if you want your customer to engage with you and, and, and have and permit an exchange with you which of which their data is a part, you've got to work out what's in it for them. Uh, and, and so that's that's the way we address that. Okay. Look, um, I'll keep things short. I'll, I'll look at wrapping things up. But looking at today's digital world yeah. and, and particularly how you recognise that there's still you still have to service basic human desires yeah. and how they change over life stages. Yeah. That was good. But considering that, what's the one thing you think that marketers really have to focus on getting right this year as we look at 2015? I think um, the the noise, the amount of marketing messages that we are we are all exposed to is just increasing, increasing, increasing and, and we're all on loads of devices and multitasking. Uh, is, is huge so cut through cut through is is absolutely key and that I think is around the quality of the creative the quality of the creative message is just more important than ever I think video is a really powerful medium and is becoming if you look at all kind of social media and internet you know the rise of video as a storytelling uh, medium uh, for creative I think is, is, is rising um, so I think and then I think there's this area of using it to engage with your consumer and I ask you to really um, put your um, your fortune teller's hat on. Think about twenty twenty five. Yes. Oh God. Marketing in twenty twenty five. Years away. That's a decade away. What? Right? What? If your children, your three yes, year olds, yes. want to become marketers, yes. What world are they going to be doing it in? Okay. I think um, uh, forecasting is a fool's game. <laughs> So so everything we I will say, go back in 20 years' time. We're going to everything play this video. I should say should be totally discounted. <laughs> I think um, no. I think marketing is becoming more telegenic. So as we look at all the marketing, you know, billboards are becoming 
rich video billboards um, and uh, even on the tube in London it's all kind of video based etc and then it's also it's becoming internet connected with return paths and, and devices are starting to sync with each other so I think that the opportunities for product and brand marketing and then relationship marketing start to come together a little bit so your classic above the line and your below the line in a more digital world where you can connect all these things together I think those disciplines will potentially come together and you'll be able to think about your product and brand marketing at the same time as your relationship marketing and, and put them through through billboards or through yeah. smartphones in a, in a more seamlessly connected way. Well thank you very much John, thanks for coming along. Thank I've you. been speaking to Jill Whitehead, Director of Audience Technologies and the Slide Channel 4 UK. Thanks for joining us today.